turning off our cell phones, especially given the subject of this tonight. <laughs> and also, uh, Sarah asked me to remind people that on the 26th, uh, Maggie will have a discussion on distracted. And then uh, also on the library's book recommendation, there's an article by Maggie that uh, will give you ideas about further reading. So uh, first, a word about the library. In 1754, when the New York Society Library was founded, the word society in the library's name had no connotation of class. Rather, its purpose was to improve the lives of New Yorkers by building a collection of books and making them available to its members. The group of civic-minded people were intent on creating, quote, a public library that would be very useful as well as ornamental to the city. And so we remain, the oldest library in the city, still thriving after 264 years. That said, please help this marvelous institution continue to thrive by supporting its wide-ranging and ongoing services and programs. I'm Jenny Lawrence, a former trustee and longtime member of the library, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Maggie Jackson this evening. Actually, she needs no introduction, as she's been a member of the library for 27 years and has haunted its writing spaces daily. As West Siders, I knew Maggie long before I officially met her, as we often passed each other going to and fro in Central Park, walkers, runners, taking our kids to schoolers. After a few years, we would nod. Uh, after a few more years, we would say hello. <laughs> then finally, when we saw each other going to and fro from the library, it was time to introduce ourselves. Turned out Maggie was writing a book in Stack 12's Green Alcove, perhaps one of the library's quietest, most peaceful corners. She was writing a book about distraction, about the pernicious erosion of attention in the internet age. A graduate of Yale University and London School of Economics, Maggie wrote an earlier book exploring the fate of home in the dig digital age called What's Happening to Home, Balancing Work, Life, and Refuge in the Information Age. Her essays and commentary have been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, on NPR, and in anthologies including State of the American Mind, 16 Leading Critics on the New Anti-Intellectualism, and the digital divide, arguments for and against Facebook, Google, texting, and the age of social networking. Grants and awards and fellowships have been many. She was a finalist for the Hillman Prize, one of journalism's highest honors for social justice reporting. And three times her website has been named a Forbes Top 100 site for women. The first edition of Distraction, Reclaiming Our Focus in a World of Lost Attention, was published 10 years ago. In the new edition of Distraction, Maggie Deeds digs deeper into issues that have only grown darker and more troubling, addressing concerns about what kind of humans we want to be today and in the future. She is at work on a new book that explores the limits of a culture based on hyper-efficiency, speed, and snap judgments and what is crucial to fostering a cultural culture of invention, deep learning, and mutual understanding. Please join me in welcoming Maggie Beck. Thank you so much, Jenny, for such a generous introduction. Um, and I would just also like to pause and thank the library and everyone who works here um, especially Carolyn Waters for her astounding leadership, always with a smile and a laugh, uh, and Sarah Elliott Holliday for making this venerable place burst with events and extroversion uh, and, uh, and so seamlessly. Um, and so many the other people um, I'd love to thank here. But particularly, I'd like to take a moment to cast on the waters of this evening a kind of silent prayer of gratitude for the muses that we find here. May they always remain. Mm -hmm. 
And last, but never least, I'd like to also just thank my husband, John, my daughters, Emma and Anna, for being here and for being with me every step of the way uh, of my journey of writing. Um, they listen and critique and converse and think ad infinitum about these issues. And thank you. So, just to begin this evening, let's just step back in time and picture Freud. It's a warm September evening in 1907, and he's standing in Rome on the Piazza Colonna, watching a lantern slideshow. That's a medley of still slides and short films that's being projected on the roofs of the houses in the piazza. And as he writes later, every time he tries to turn away, quote, a certain tension in the attentive crowd keeps him gazing. He is, in his words, spellbound. Imagine this thinker, long ago, far from home, entranced by the precursors of the media that envelop us today. Finally, waking from his automated reverie, lonely in the crowd, he returns to his room to write a letter home. Now, fast forward to our digitized, computerized day. Re we revel as well in the wonders, the answers at our fingertips, the speed and connectivity of social relationships in our pockets, and yet also sense the stolen time. That we sense that the pace and objects of our focus are not always under our control. We too are torn and uneasy. 70% of Americans now say that technology has overall improved the quality of their lives. And yet equal numbers say that it's making us lazy and distracted. 40% of tech experts and scholars say that technology has helped more than hurt our well-being, and yet a third say the reverse. We're conflicted, and this time there's no easy going home. There's no easy way to turn away. We can't just tinker at the edges of this new way of life. We've gone in deep. We can't just visit the virtual. It's now our mental habitat. Studies now show that on average, people are checking their phones 100, 150. I just heard from Google 185 times a day. Technology is not over there in a box, but it's a part of us. One recent study found that one third of phone owners rated themselves as close or closer to their devices as their friends. <laughs> Technology becomes us and vice versa. And distraction, well, not so long ago, it was kind of a part-time malady, sort of a semi-joke. We're all catching ADHD, we used to joke. Now, of course, splintered focus and lives awash in trivia are constant. So the time is ripe to look far more closely and deeply at all we have wrought so quickly and often unthinkingly. It's time to hammer a new path forward. And the good news is that I see a nascent, embryonic yearning to do so. We're questioning the inventors who often underestimated or perhaps chose to ignore the implications of their creations. There's a new rallying cry, digital well-being. And we're awakening to the toll of distraction all around us, lives lost on the roads and in hospitals, time squandered in classrooms, homes, and offices. And yet, there's much more that needs to be done. Tonight, I'm going to discuss life at the intersection of technology and attention. For at this meeting point lies the fate of our most important human faculty. At this juncture lies our ability to manage our minds. I'll discuss first how our capacity for attention and thinking is being changed over time by a constant diet of tech-induced interruptions. And secondly, what is the fate of meaning-making when knowledge becomes something we think of as push-button, easy, and quick? And finally, how can we thrive in this new milieu while taming the excesses of our time. There is so much at stake in this discussion. 
and I would add urgency to this endeavor. For our unease is pitted against a larger force of complacency. As we become one with the machine, as we move from adoption to immersion to technology as a given, it becomes more difficult to gain perspective. What ceases to be novel recedes into the background of life. It's kind of like that old joke you've probably heard about the fish in the water. One swims up to the other and says, how's the water? And the other says, what water? <laughs> it's not just the devices themselves that we increasingly take for granted, but their new ways of being that they inspire. You know, who notices electric light now, much less the biorhythms that have been changed so radically as a result? We may soon be at the cusp of a time when many no longer will be able to have a deep conversation or remember what it was like to do so. We may be on the brink of an era when we've eradicated moments for quiet presence, reflection from our lives, and we no longer will miss them when they're gone. When I first began writing about technology's impact on humanity back in the late 1990s, I was an English major quite unwelcome at the table of the computer revolution. I proposed stories on the digital divide, and people would say, that's been done. I tried to get the Boston Globe to um, have a story on the virtual family back in 2006 or 7. It fell on deaf ears. Because at that time, only geeks and programmers were really allowed to invent or interpret the changes bearing down upon us. But now, we all have a place at the table of this revolution, and it's crucial that we awaken to the possibilities and the perils before us. It's crucial that we speak up. So begin, to begin, what does it mean to be, to, to be distracted? You know, it's a word that we often take for granted. In common use, we think of it as something pulled to something secondary, diverted, you know, by a buzzing phone, for instance. But that notion, I think, doesn't quite do justice to the tenor, the tempo of our lives, to the problem of distraction. A more accurate description of our condition, I think, is captured by a now largely forgotten definition of the word that means to be scattered, to be fragmented, to be pulled in pieces. It was common once upon a time to say after a death that his book collection was distracted. And in Shakespeare, Antony and, and Antony and Cleopatra, a soldier says of Caesar, his power went out in such distractions as beguiled all spies. Well, that quote actually hints at the promise and the potential inherent in porous attention. You know, when the boundaries of our focus loosen, we can be open to new possibilities. We gain breadth of mind. But, a new explosion of scientific research shows that a constant diet of splintered focus is costly. It's brain training of the very worst sort. So, multitasking. We all know by now that the evidence shows that it's stressful, it's frustrating, and it causes errors in the moment. I was speaking at a conference here in New York uh, to uh, 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 digital advertisers to people who were responsible for the advertising and the media. And a lot of people were tweeting during the event, which was great, it was flattering. And yet, I kind of out of curiosity went back and looked through the Twitter threads of some of the people who had tweeted the most. And they had gotten many of the points of the talk wrong. <laughs> it can happen to us all. We're all trying to keep up. But now we're discovering the price we pay long term, the hidden spillover effects, so to speak, of splintering our attention constantly. When we splice our focus, for instance, while learning something new, it could be the school lesson, it could be the boss's presentation, it means we can actually only absorb information in shallow ways. Why? Because when you're focused fully on something, you're using parts of the brain related to rich hippocampal memory. The brain is actually readying itself as it absorbs the information to assimilate that new information into our knowledge networks that change and swell and grow and are sifting all the time, sifting themselves. 
that can be a weeks-long process to actually absorb some new information into your knowledge networks. But when you multitask, you're using different parts of the brain, different networks of the brain related to short-term, shallow processing. Information can be learned, but you're later less able to use that information flexibly. It's often more ephemeral as well. So for an example, you have a surgeon. They've been half listening to those lessons in medical school that relate to a bleed or tying the knot. Fast forward, they're practicing, a crisis happens, they can do the textbook save, what they exactly might have learned with half an ear in medical school, but they're befuddled by even a slightly different problem. It's called knowledge transfer. They can't improvise, they can't creatively build on the past. Knowledge build, built, uh, gleaned while multitasking is more rigid and fragile. Sometimes professors have told me about college students who are multitasking so often during the classroom, they might be able to multitask through Econ 101, they might even be able to get an A, but when they return in the spring, it's as if they hadn't even taken the introductory course. Today, a growing body of research is showing that avid multitaskers, people who are steeped in this way of life, are more reactive. They have a harder time staying on task or returning to a task once interrupted. They're less able to see complex patterns and less able to tell the trivial from the important in their environment. It's as if they're looking at life from the window of a speeding train. They are, as one Stanford professor says, quote, suckers for irrelevancy. Might ring some bells about our public and private life today. <laughs> Now we still don't know, of course, that if, if heavy multitasking directly hurts attentional abilities, or if certain people are predisposed to, toward such habits and so are vulnerable to these deficits. But there's reason to be concerned in our milieu of split focus. And perhaps most alarming is that avid multitaskers are most oblivious to their ineffectiveness. Those who multitask the most are least aware of their shortcomings, and they do at least well. In a slightly different context, Jane Austen put it very well when she wrote in Pride and Prejudice, the power of doing anything with quickness is always much prized by the possessor, often without any attention to the imperfection of the performance. <laughs> <laughs> so today, our moments are crowded information is cacophonous and splintered attention that seems the ticket to success is instead linked to shallow and flexible learning and less ability to discern. But that's not all. I see a further vulnerability, perhaps even a greater peril, emerging at the intersection of technology and attention today. A culture reliant on split focus driven by instantaneity and all-out values of efficiency begins to redefine what it means to know. Consider this, racing from task to task, make, we make ex implicit assumptions that we can know at a glance. You know, hopscotching through our days, we assume that the problems and people before us and all their nuance, their complexity, their hidden facets can be understood at a snap. This is nowhere more apparent than online. Of course, we search online and the answers appear magically. It's wonderful. But studies now show that after just a brief time searching online, people are less willing to struggle with a complex problem. Their need for cognition, so to speak, falls sharply. They become more willing to turn back to the net to solve the very easiest problems that they could, with a little bit of thinking, know. And finally, a bit of Googling, and we begin to think that we know more than we do. So even after searching in vain, people in research studies um, vastly under overestimate what, can they, what answers they can do without, without the internet. As one scientist said, they, quote, never have to face their ignorance. It's all so easy. It seems a part of us. It comes at a snap. Short change our focus, assume we can know at a glance, and it's not just information, but wisdom itself that seems push-button easy. Is it a coincidence, I wonder, 
that the aesthetics of the digital world reflect these assumptions. What do we see but boxes made up of bullet points, PowerPoints, template-based ideas? Claude Shannon, who is the father of information theory, as, um, nearly half a century ago, uh, founded the, gave the theory that underlies our computer revolution. And in a nutshell, he ascertained that, of course, information is uncertain. It's messy. It's rough about the edges. It's prone to misunderstanding. But if we make information, he wrote, standardized, interchangeable, if we turn facts and stories and data into a language of bits, it becomes streamlined and easy to exchange. In the running of the information machine, delivery is paramount. Meaning doesn't matter. Shannon's legacy to us is to underscore the idea that knowing is instant and easy. So today, are we reaping the possibilities that come our way in this split-focused world? Or are we determined to believe that the minimal, the insufficient, in thinking and relationships is good enough? Attention, attention, is a set of skills of three interacting but distinct brain networks that enable us to interact with the world and with ourselves. It's how we manage our minds. There's focus, which is a spotlight of the mind. There's wakefulness, which is awareness of your I mean, awareness, which is wakefulness to your surroundings. You can be focused on me and be half asleep. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's executive attention, which is the symphony that has been des described as the symphony conductor of the brain. So of course we need the lightning fast read on the situation, the guesstimates, the impressions offered by snippets of focus, but attention is the gateway to so much more. Focus is the means of sustaining thought in the service of problem solving. Awareness allows us to see those hidden facets of the world that we can't catch at a glance. And executive attention enables us to plan, to filter, to speculate, to not just reach for a solution, but for the better solution. Attention is the means by which we can tap into the questioning, skeptical, deliberate, higher order mind that's so often left behind in a quick trigger world. <laughs> in the last few decades, longitudinal studies of creativity in the United States show that Americans, from kindergartners to adults, are less inventive, less imaginative, less flexible, less able to see problems from multiple angles, again rings a bell, especially in the last 10 years. But the measure that suffered the most steep drop of all these creativity measures is something called elaboration. That means putting flesh on an idea, sticking with it, building, testing, knowing, in the deepest sense of the word, that measure has suffered a 40% drop from kindergarten again, from child, children to adulthood, from 1984 to 2008, but in particularly in the last decade. Today, we live in a society that above all values the quick, the automatic, the facile, and that's the very definition of a machine. One related study, a very small study out of Harvard, found that people rated themselves better now at locating information than at working through a problem for themselves, as if they were search engines. So undercut our attention, splinter our focus, and we truly shortcut our abilities to discern, to reason, to question, to daydream, the cognitive work that only humans can do. Not that long ago, a virtual reality pioneer, maybe you've heard of him, Jaron Lanier, he was at, in Stanford at the business school judging a contest of young entrepreneurs. And so all day long, the young students would jump up on stage and give their rapid fire presentations of the businesses they had concocted. And at the end of the day, two young gentlemen rose up and they had, they had created an app. 
and they told Manye and the other judges that this app was going to find the best dates in bars. The pretty girls, the handsome guys. And Lanye listened as he tells the story and thought and heard the presentation and said, that's technically not feasible, it's subjective, that's not going to work. And the two young guys said, we know we're selling hope. <laughs> well, we are hopeful that a glance will suffice, that one tempo will do, and that the machinery of our days will carry us forward effortlessly, and that by becoming more machine-like, we can progress. Today, we're angry at big tech and still searching for that app that can help us manage our focus. We lament the swamp of hostility and reactivity that the internet has become, and yet measure our worth in terms of followers, and accept policymaking by tweet. As Langdon Winner once said of technology, as we make things work, what kind of world are we making? And that was in 1983. We could not, would not want to strip ourselves of these technological tools. We are humans, the makers. But the real question is, where does our responsibility lie as humans in shaping the technology and our minds? Today, we're not asking the right questions of our devices, and we're not asking enough of ourselves. So tonight, I talked a little bit about the insufficiency of split focus and the complacency of an instant answer living. I've discussed attention as the vehicle to another side of ourselves, the kind of digressive, deliberative mind we need so urgently today. How then do we begin, to paraphrase T.S. Eliot, to have the experience and not miss the meaning? I have three ideas, very rough starting points. First, let's rethink the idea of boundaries to sew up the unraveled skeins of our attention. Now, this seems very archaic, imprisoning. I mean, we tore down boundaries from the industrial age between home and work, and now we're valiantly trying to tear down boundaries between virtual and physical. <laughs> we're free. It's the anytime, anywhere culture. And yet, boundaries are demarcations. When we think, we, we can think of the weekend, the job description, a child's bedtime. There's systems of prioritization, safety zones, and structures for depth. I like to think of them as an embrace. Focus is the most important boundary making of all. Today, we need boundaries to restore the integrity of the moment. For instance, the creative use of boundaries of time and space. Tech-free dinner hours, putting the phone in the trunk while driving. Some companies even mandate that. Or a study showed that kids, and I think it could apply to adults, who take a one-minute break every 15 minutes from technology bolster their attention. Google, as you've probably heard, and Apple are now driving to put product features in their devices that promote a stepping away from that seamless, constant engagement that has been at the heart of their business model and part of the commoditization of attention for hundreds of years. It's a start. And of course, boundaries should not be just for stepping away from technology. For instance, if we take proactive steps within the digital sphere, we can help better navigate through the hyperlinked environments that we experience there. You know, batching email. We've probably heard it, but do we actually do it? Looking at email just a few times a day bolsters attention. And rules and rituals are kind of a foundational boundary making. You know, household rules, no Snapchat until age 12 or some such, actually work. They result in less media use, exposure to better choice of content online by children, and more face-to-face -face interaction in the, in the family. And yet half of American households have no rules whatsoever regarding media. Of course, parents today are adrift on these swirling tides of technology and attention constantly reacting 
feeling unable to look ahead or envision digital well-being at home. Boundaries are a crucial way for parents to parent, and it offers a chance for them to role model attention as well. So boundaries can help us declutter the habitats and the habits that undercut our attention. But that's just a starting point. Because boundaries do not guarantee blissful togetherness or perfect focus, they protect, they protect the fragile beginning moments that might blossom into something more. They offer the soil, as it were, in which we can cultivate the squandered opportunities we have to think and connect. They set the stage for the practice of attention that is the means to deeper bonding and learning. So the second step toward a renaissance of attention, I believe, is practice. You know, the jury is in. The brain is plastic, even into adulthood. As we know, our experience shapes our minds. We might know this, but are we living it? As I discussed, daily diets of foot focus undercut our cognition, and that literally reshapes the neural connections that constitute thought. And yet, plasticity, of course, can be as much a blessing as a curse. One landmark new study found that just three single doses of mindful meditation, that is, focusing on the breath, significantly reduced the attentional deficits shown by the avid, heavy multitaskers. It cut in half their distractibility, their inability to, to filter. Of course, there's no one-shot solution you know, that was a short-term effect. Attention needs to be constantly practiced, like exercise does to our muscles. And this is, I think, why that digital detox that is so often tried and so often abandoned, you know, has little impact. Because there's this idea that you put down the technology, maybe naturally, in a kind of Rousseauian way, all these skills will flood back to us, when really, that's only the starting point. So, but, and, but the good news is that there are daily opportunities to practice attention all around us. The nursery games, just as, you know, such as Simon says, actually boost executive function skills such as uh, cognitive flexibility and working memory. Those are skills very close to attention. We have so many other chances throughout the day just by keeping a conversation going keeping a shopping list in not mind, helping a child be wakeful to their surroundings. On the sidewalks of New York, there's so many opportunities. These are all ways to train and practice our attention. Attention is too crucial, too integral to humanity to be boosted in a quick fix by a game or a pill, but the starting points to becoming athletes of attention are all around us. So finally, how can we bolster our attention? Well, on the macro front, I think we need to do so much more to push back on our unthinking reverence for the machine, a stance that reduces our humanity. We can start by simply updating our language. You know, the brain is not a computer. Memory is not something neatly stored as if in a file, ready for downloading or uploading. Ideas don't emerge fully formed like bullet points from our minds. This idea of the brain as computization was a useful machine age metaphor that allowed uh, people, and scientists particularly, to kind of crack open the black, black, black box of the brain. But it's now been largely discarded by scientists as doing little justice to the complex, networked, organic nature of our minds. Today, instead, what we might call inefficiencies of thinking are now taking center stage in brain research. Some of the hottest discoveries in neuroscientists center on, for example, the importance of daydreaming to our well-being, or the idea that conscious awareness, that wakefulness, is a graded phenomenon, not an on and off state. Or even that robust problem solving occurs when we let a challenge rest overnight or pause for just a minute or two. It's time to revalue this other side of ourselves, 
the realms of thinking enabled by skilled attention, the side of humanity so often in the shadows of our life today. By doing so, we wake up to the full spectrum of our human capabilities, including our capacity to understand that we make errors. By doing so, we restore our faith in all that the human mind can do. So let us go forth into the piazza of digital life, ready to chart new ways to flourish as humans attentively. At this intersection of technology and attention, at the beginning stages of this revolution, we are torn and troubled. And yet, that's how it should be. We should celebrate our unease as a yearning to at last gain some perspective on all we have created in the technological world. We should value our conflicted feelings about technology as the instigators of discovery. At the, at the, as the first steps toward mastering our attentional skills that are the paths to invention and wisdom. Questioning, after all, is the opposite of complacence and compliance. Lately, I've begun to think of distraction as a kind of hubris. Because it's really an assumption, I think, that the shallow is all we need, that the easy way out is enough. Attention, in contrast, is rooted in the Latin word for to reach towards something. It's a form of care, as I discovered at the very end of my journey of writing this book. I'm going to read just a small passage um, from the end of my journey. As I say, I was up in the Colorado foothills um, at the largest study of attention ever undertaken. It was a study of meditators who had been doing this for three months, nonstop, in a retreat. And the results are just now coming out, seven years later. And this is just a little bit of what happened that I think illuminates what that word attention means. Attending to, caring for, watching over, looking after. There's a real sweetness to that. I was in the retreat center with uh, the former translator to the Dalai Lama, who was leading the meditative contemplative side of this venture. Clad in a sports shirt and chinos, Wallace sat cross-legged on a chair in his room at the retreat, mulling over vocabularies of attention with me, savoring each as if tasting a fine old wine. Before I headed home, he preferred a last thought. If a person leaps in and sacrifices his life, you leap in, you save a baby, and then you die, you've given your whole life in one piece, said Wallace in his characteristic staccato speak. That's a wonderful sacrifice. Greater love hath no man than he who lays down his life for another. So that's pretty good. But when, he give, when we give, he continued, but when we give another person our attention, we're giving away that portion of our life from moment to moment. Attention. The cultivation of attention is absolutely core. It really is the linchpin. It is the key. On the way back to Denver to catch my flight, I got lost in the mountain foothills and began to panic, seeing few houses or cars for miles. And at last, a man in a pickup truck rumbled toward me, and I flagged him down. Follow me, he said with a warm smile when I asked for help. I'm going that way. Thank you.
hires, we no longer be the employers, and that maybe the younger generation who's used to not really embellishing will be the employers, and their conversation will seem very normal to each other. How are you? How are you? How are you? You know, they never actually say how they are, they just keep going back and forth. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and you, I think you're jumping off the word elaboration. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, no, that's really interesting. Well, first, I try to stay away from, you know, I mean, I was teaching a class at Border recently, and the, the people who were sophomores or juniors, I was very surprised. I thought they were the so-called digital natives, and they were extremely worried about their five-year-old cousins, say to say. <laughs> so that's sort of interesting in a number of ways. I try to stay away from you know pure generational kind of observations because I think that this is a cross-generational issue and that you know attention is something that's being under siege no matter how old or young you are. Um, you know, that said, I also think that there are benefits, of course, to, you know, a more succinct forms of communication. Um, you know, we all understand that in organizations, that getting to the point or having sort of a, almost an impatience for too much elaboration is important. Um, you know, but I think it's a, it's a really tricky balance uh, because there's so obviously changes that are going to be occurring to, say, two-year-olds now. I just read a study that showed that, correlationally at least, uh, a higher use of tablet use among toddlers was correlated with mothers, um, some depressive symptoms. And this was part of a number of different kind of studies that were sort of hinting at or circling at or touching on or suggesting, one might say, um, that you know moments of co-parenting, that is togetherness, when everybody really is all together, that are shattered by technology, um, are then lead to stress and frustration, to mistrust of the partner. So you know there's obviously something really going on, and I think that we have to be really careful about um, you know what's beneficial and what's negative. Um, but there are increasing numbers of pointers to show that we should be concerned. So I can't really comment particularly on what people do in the workplace in that case, but I think that it's something, there's reason enough to be to, to concerned. Thank you. I thought that was a very good and very interesting question. And <laughs> really, and uh, it got me to thinking about um, how if the majority of younger people wind up uh, suffering a sort of self-alienation because of the distractions that are preventing them from um, being mindful you know, situations or being um, good critical thinking, uh, whether or not it will create a sort of two-tiered system of uh, elite thinkers who are younger people who have somehow managed to avoid all of that damage and really do have critical thinking skills and really are able to elaborate on things, will they then be at you know, an enormous advantage intellectually um, you know, compared with uh, the rest of everyone else? You know? mm -hmm. Um, I think I made that mistake with the specter of Fahrenheit 451, or uh, what is the sci-fi novel where the people are hiding in the woods and, yeah. and they, yeah, yeah. The, the books are. Um, well, I think that's really interesting, and they, you know, the the reason I was proposing long ago a story in the digital divide was that um, the story that I was proposing was that the digital divide wasn't a matter of just putting boxes in community centers and then <laughs> backing away. Not just because in low-income neighborhoods often the, the technology wasn't kept up. You know, people then couldn't use it very well. There are these, those sorts of issues. So it's still true. Um, but also because it's that motif of learning well, you know, information literacy, using the computer, et cetera. So this this kind of motif or really, you know, vision of a divided society, I think, is, um, you know, very, very important um, and possible because, I mean, on the good side, you know, people who think uh, can communicate in the workplace, can maybe have more, you know, better relationships at home and family, 
but at the same time, it might exacerbate the already, you know, terrifying schisms between have and have nots all over the, you know, I, this is something, and also it's really interesting because I mentioned this term digital well-being has suddenly been springing up and, you know, I know that, um, you know, I've been thinking about work-life balance for a really, really long time. That's initially how I got into uh, thinking about technology's impact on work-life balance. And so this, this, this idea, this catchword has been thrown around, the technology companies and there's going to be a civil dialogue in DC on digital well-being in, in a month or so that I'm taking part in. Um, it's, it's part of that frustration against technology. Well, what does it mean? That's really interesting because I did sort of go <coughs> into measures and scenarios of digital well-being, say, at the OECD. I mean, I'm sorry, of well-being at the OECD or the you know, WHO or, um, you know, that, that there is this whole stream of research on happiness and getting beyond happiness as a measure and, and opening that up and be thinking more broadly about, you know, it's not money we know anymore that makes people happy, so what is it teasing that about? There's a really good, interesting flow of research now, but then there's this new kind of interest in digital well-being and neither side seems to be talking to one another. It seems as though we somehow need to create vocabularies or language, either include into measures and very big global lenses into um, well-being, include the digital in that, or adopt perhaps some of the vocabulary around that. You know, there are measures that come from the psychology and philosophy fields that deal with um, some pillars of well-being, such as autonomy. Do we have autonomy for ourselves when we're online? Um, measures of control, which is a little bit different. You know, do we have freedom? as human beings online? Um, are we feeling um, joyful? Uh, you know, are we happy? That's not the only measure. And I'm trying to think of some of the others. But these are some really interesting pillars that come from good research that should be, you know, talked about in that. And I don't really have the answers. I think it's a really very important uh, step forward to be talking about digital well-being. But if we're reinventing the wheel, then that's not going to perhaps get as far and as fast as we could. Um, so I think you're, if, you know, the issue of the division um, might also segue to just wrap that back to your question into the idea of you know global inequalities are talked about. So maybe um, you know maybe that can be also part of the whole mix of the discussions about digital well-being. Um, I'd be curious to as to what your take is on how we talk about artificial intelligence. It, it seems to me that there's a common assumption that uh, computers can, uh, with artificial intelligence, literally displace people and what they do. And I'm just wondering how that fits in with your thesis about destruction. Yeah, I wish I knew a lot more about artificial intelligence. Um, I think that it's, I, I'm not, at that expert. I'm trying to be a student of what's going on right now. Um, I know that I was at an MIT Media Lab last week, I think, and Joey Ito, the head of MIT Media Lab, was speaking about the need, and I think at long last, happily, you know, thankfully, speaking about the need in artificial intelligence in particular to get people from the humanities into that discussion, to get the poets, you know, people talk about poets and wants. But so, you know, there really isn't a whole lot of discussion, you know, there. So that's re a really important new kinds of ways of seeing that does that answer the idea of, you know, whether or not we're going to be taken over by robots or whether or not we're, our jobs are going to be stolen by robots. I mean, the, 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 it's astonishing how many decisions in our daily lives are decided by algorithms from which medical test you take or with who you might marry online after you know looking around. So it's it's really an invisible thing, and there's a second layer of invisibility, which is that the people who are creating artificial intelligence, well, a not aren't really sure of the ripple effects. That's been often true of, say, the telephone, the telegraph, the laptop, etc. But this is a wholly different plane of not understanding the vision of the future. But second, people don't understand, and not 
that, that, that's, a, that's their deficit, it's just it cannot be yet understood how computers come to decisions. And this whole, you know, the, the programming used to be transparent, at least to some. Now it's such that people who are creating this don't understand what, how it comes to certain um, uh, conclusions. And I think Article 22 of the European Data Privacy Act, which is a really big new push to gain the privacy that we don't have here, they're very, very far ahead of the curve. I mean, but as part of Article 22 of, I mean, Article 22 of that act is something that hasn't gotten very much attention. It says that in Europe now, it's law that a human being has the right to appeal a decision made by an algorithm. It's legal. And we don't have that. You know, that's really important. That's really important. So this is one little line in an article, and I, I'd like to learn more. Um, so there's a lot to learn. Thank you. Um, yes. you, know, I'm, you mentioned about the hippocampus, and I'm wondering from the side of neurobiology, what studies are going on about how all this is affecting the brain? Yeah, that's a really, um, how, and if anyone can hear the question, how, how all, the, you know, the technology is affecting the brain. I mean, the short answer is that, you know, these often are short-term effects that we don't know, you know, I think that there are longer-term effects hinted at strongly, as I talked about, when people are living these diets of split focus, just for instance. Um, so the fact that the brain can be trained is important, the fact that the, you know, brain is plastic, that's important. We don't really know all the answers. Um, and, you know, I think that as far as memory is concerned, I've been wondering about that for a very, very long time. Uh, very little is being done on that. You know, these, this, this study on learning new information is part of some, a kind of push to understand memory. But memory scientists were asking about this 10 years ago. So, I mean, the brain is resilient. Uh, I don't at all, um, you know, sign on to, you know, this is rewiring our brains in some kind of categorical fashion, but I think it's something to really watch out for. Um, there are probably scientists in the audience who, you know, maybe have more to say or disagree, but uh, maybe, Catherine? I actually have a related question. Um, is there a biological response to, like, the ringing of a phone or do cortisol levels go up, adrenaline? Does that have a long-term effect? Are there studies on... Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, a lot has been talked about the dopamine, the reward-based centers of the brain lighting up when we're, you know, when we obviously are wondering what that ring or beep is. Um, again, it's really hard, it would be impossible in some ways to study that because, you know, well, A, people are so stressed in other ways, so it would be hard to find, you know, kind of a stress-free individual to um, you know, <laughs> to, to, to have their phone buzz. But, I mean, it, the, the technology in daily life is certainly, again, linked strongly to, you know, stress and frustration. You know, taking away people's phones is linked to anxiety, at least short-term measures, you know, kind of sweat factors and things like that. Um, you know, there's also, on the flip side, or not the flip side, or looking at both sides, you know, some really interesting research about the phone, uh, and again, in terms of well-being, in terms of the social network. So it's not just, oh, you have the phone on the table, you're having a worse conversation, which is what some studies are showing, or your intelligence drops immediately, or you're caught, even if it's off and silent, and in, within sight, your cognitive fluid reasoning ability goes down. Now that's, again, all of these kind of, you know, hints. Um, but also, people who use their phone for information quite a bit are more likely to um, be less trusting of neighbors and strangers. Really interesting. Same scientists did these really fascinating studies on college campuses asking people to either find a building that they didn't know, um, you know, the location of by a phone or by just uh, going out without a phone. Now, he didn't tell them to ask people. Most of the time, 60, 70, 80%, 80% of the time, the non-phone, the naked, you know, the naked searchers were, uh, you know, actually um, asking people. And then their measures of well-being, uh, their social connectivity to the campus, to their community, were really, had really risen 
after that tiny little encounter, those who used the phone found it more uh, efficient. They found the building more often, um, but they, are, they felt more disconnected. Just a tiny little hint. And what that is really interesting to me is that it shows again um, that you know, efficiency is what we want. It makes us happy. It's, you know, get from A to B, do not digress, et cetera, do not talk. Now that really, they're, they're positives there, absolutely. But at the same time, that digression, that uh, eye contact with the barista, that, you know, asking someone for directions, you know, is a really potent moment of social um, connection that's being lost. You know, a very invisible little emotion. And another little study that about efficiency is uh, there was the first time a study uh, took people who and, and had them meet online or face to face, but they were meeting strangers. So online, very briefly, ten minutes or so, have a conversation. Um, you know, they found it easier. You know, they got to know more, maybe even I think. And then, but the ones uh, who had met the stranger in face to face, they rated it as awkward. They rated it as more difficult. And they rated that they liked the person more, they wanted to follow up with them, and they wanted to, um, you know, they, they had a more pleasant conversation, even though it was more awkward. So that just shows a, a huge something. I often think, I often think, you know, well, what is it that we're finding out when we find something out, when we find out that something's quick and easy? What is it that we're finding out? Yes. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm not going in any order. Just feel like, go like this if you've been waiting a long time. You mentioned uh, digital life and the law. What are your thoughts on uh, friends uh, having instituted uh, from this day onward forward to have 15 year old uh, children and young adults not take their phone to school at all? And the boss also cannot send you emails after 5 p.m. in the afternoon. So what do you think about these things? And how could this be instituted in a land where there's so many lawyers, like the United States? <laughs> so France had instituted. I heard a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that's you know one of those dicey America, liberty, would we ever want to regulate that? Or, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that's really interesting. I suppose if we give gender equality in a board a little nudge to make it happen, then maybe, you know, there could be guidelines. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you're, if you're asking me about the content of the law or whether or not laws are a good idea to help us in these circumstances. That's How do you think the children will be beneficially influenced or not? Oh, from not having phones in school? Yeah. Um, I think absolutely. At least the classroom should be a haven because the, the distraction and interruptibility is just really shown to you know, negate their ability to think. Um, it's it's you know, correlated with lower grades, etc. Um, you know, so much, there's so many great things happening with technology in the classroom. You know, it can be used in so many inventive ways. But um, you know, when someone is listening and absorbing this new information, I think there is a place for not having technology every single minute. And at least it used to. I mean, my kids are out of school basically, but it used to be, you know, that it was a haven from the social media or the pressures to be always on. I mean, these are pressures that adults have so much difficulty handling, and so we're asking the kids to live in this swamp with this value system, it's very, very difficult. Um, yes, Jennifer's been raising her hand. Um, I, I have a comment for that, and um, I have a question. Um, I, I, you might know more than me, but I was a board of ed teacher, and schools in New York were phone free before 9-11. The admired in the, if I remember correctly, that they changed the rules after 9-11. And a lot of the school buildings don't have very good reception anyway, or they have reception purposefully blocked. 
episodes on. But uh, I've been thinking about a lot about have you studied the difference between the brain of someone who grew up with the internet from a baby and the older person? Because I think a lot about this and I'm pretty paranoid about it. I didn't use the internet or cell phone until I was 31, okay? But my son grew up with it. And I just don't see a lot of the things people say. My son can have a very long philosophical uh, conversation. He does have very intimate friendships with people in person. He can wander off for half an hour and not check his phone just organically. So I'm having a hard time. I mean, is that unusual? Is that well, I think, no, that's a really good point. I mean, there's such a spectrum, you know, there's such a spectrum of um, difficulties of, you know, I don't want to use the word addiction, but the, uh, you know, spectrum of use, spectrum of response, you know, spectrum, and we're just beginning to get a handle on maybe how family situation interacts with personality, interacts with, you know, degree of intensity of technology. We've moved so far on from the time when it was just the content on the box, on the TV, and that's what media was to children. And so now there are these really multi-pronged, interesting studies. I mean, I think absolutely, you know, there are people across generations who are having conversations, having, you know, wonderful, you know, working through problems. But just from what I'm saying, I see winds blowing that we should all be concerned, even if it's not in our household, um, mm -hmm. that we should be concerned by the people who maybe don't have as resilient or you know, um, supportive a um, you know, family structure or economic situation. Um, so therefore, you know, this is all our problem in a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm really glad you raised that point. We have time for one, one more question. Okay. Maggie, is, um, is information being used to mean answer, in essence? Mm -hmm. Algorithms arrive at necessary answers, for example, for a technical way. And would the issue of know-how be of any value here in terms of knowing how to answer questions, even know how to question questions? Mm -hmm. Spoken like a philosopher. <laughs> um, uh, I think that yes, I would think, I, if you're asking, I, I think that so often information is being conflated with answers. Um, so there needs to be kind of an unpacking of that, that what we are gaining from the internet is something that needs to be worked upon or seen skeptically or torn apart and put back together, et cetera, too often it's just the answer. And when we search, what comes up, it's, it's gotten better, it's prioritized, it looks so, you know, uh, very high majorities of people don't look past the first page of search results, nor use anything but the first answer. And of course it is because it's gotten better, but I think to speak to your first question, and then the issue of know-how, you know, if you mean kind of tacit, automatic, no, okay, I'm thinking because know-how is often used in craftsmanship as the implicit kind of, I know how to the fiber of my being, how to cut that wood and I don't have to think about it, so I'm gonna think, you know, I don't know what know-how means in that situation. Skills um, 10,000 hours. Oh, right, well that's the same you thing. Have, you develop the proper know-how of, of a master, somebody yes. who's skillful at yes. something. Um, <coughs> yes. And, Handle new questions, respond to yes. inquiries that he's never heard before, simply because he knows how to do that kind of thing. Right. Well, you know, that's really interesting because 
you know, that kind of automaticity, which is born in two types of kind of intuitive, heuristic ways of being. The heuristic of, I something first is best. The, the information the jury hears first is seen best. First impressions, yeah. But that's what, that's what we as humans evolved to have these kind of shortcut types of thinking. But then there's this whole other type of heuristics, which isn't really as talked about as much in the whole quick, slow debate of thinking. And that is, you know, born of experience. You know, the chess master looks at the board and with a glance, you know, they have the memory, they have the stored patterns, they can know exactly what to do. And that's actually, this is being drawn from my new book on uncertainty. And, and, and those sort of questions, but the, you know, the expert's expert is now being totally revised because that automaticity, that fluency, that machine-like speed is what we've always venerated in the surgeon, in the craftsman, in the lawyer, what have you. And yet now um, there's new evidence that shows it's actually the person who knows how to stop and pause and invoke that deliberative. It's actually the person who is unsure, not permanently, but it's that faltering, that hesitation that we're so afraid of that actually is this kind of gateway to, you know, and having the intentional skills, of course, to do that kind of thing. So I think know-how is um, something that might be, you know, related to what I've been talking about in terms of, you know, the quick, the speed, the instantaneity that we're venerating in this um, society. And um, it's, uh, it's really complicated, but that, I just think that um, it's really interesting in terms of expertise that it's not always the quick and speedy. And you know, study after study show, I should add, that the most experienced doctors or the most experienced lawyers are the ones who, um, experience is not always correlated with uh, skill. So, you know, people who rest, they're called routine experts. They're resting on their laurels, which happens to everybody. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so thank you so much.